Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the privilege of interviewing William Goss. William graduated with a BS in plant genetics from UC Davis with a fungal biology and ecology minor. He has taken his passion for mycology and really transformed it into an impressive and multifaceted career. His roots lie into fundamental appreciation for the natural world, and that's evidenced by his past role as an environmental educator, teaching in the Santa Cruz Mountains outdoor schools for three years. Eventually, his passion for mycology and cultivating mushrooms guided him to become a grower supervisor and water systems operator for the continent's largest organic mushroom farm. He worked his way into the cutting edge of mycological technology with a role as a production lead for MycoWorks, which is a San Francisco Bay Area biotech startup that specializes in growing and processing mycelium leather. Now, William is the Chief Technology Officer for Mycosystemics, leaders in mushroom cultivation technology and infrastructure. So not content just to push mycology forward by being a key member on some of these brilliant teams in the private sector, William has also taken on a huge role as an advocate for plant medicine. He has taken on a lead role at Decriminalize California, which aims to decriminalize psilocybin-containing mushrooms and other entheogenic substances. With this kind of resume, we could probably do five podcasts, but today we're going to try to focus in on his recent efforts with the decriminalized movement. Will, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, when I got your CV or resume, I was really impressed with kind of the scope of the work you've done in the mushroom mycology world. Uh, and, you know, like I said, we could talk about all these different projects. I have questions for you all over the map, but we'll try to focus in on a topic that, as we were talking before the show, is a little bit contentious, a little bit of a gray area for a lot of people. We've heard of decriminalize, maybe some of the groups involved, but I don't have a crystal clear understanding of what that means. And there are a lot of arguments and issues that get brought up around it. So I'm excited to dive into that with, with someone who's at kind of the front of, front of the charge on this. I appreciate that and the opportunity. And I also like that you used the word or phrase gray area because that is a actually a way to describe what we're talking about with uh, black market, white market, and, and the gray area, the gray market of uh, entheogens. And just to clear one thing up, uh, we're talking specifically mushrooms. Uh, we are not uh, decriminalized nature, which works with uh, plant medicine. So we're singularly focused on the, uh, the mushroom medicine. Okay, that is a really good clarification. So we're not talking about ibogaine and ayahuasca, all these other things, you're centered on psilocybin exactly. mushrooms. Exactly. Yeah. Is there a reason you guys focused in on just that? Was it kind of some of the issues surrounding other medicines that you didn't want to get bogged down in? Or Yeah, that's a really great question, actually, about, um, you know, these mul multiple layers. Uh, and maybe it's, it's um, the way government works, or, um, you know, our reductionist scientist brains work, but there's maybe more uh, approachable methods within politics, within government, within uh, developing this campaign uh, to focus singularly on, on one medicine over a wide range of medicines. Though we draw a lot of our inspiration from Portugal, uh, having decriminalized all drugs, uh, as they put it uh, back in uh, 2001, uh, almost 20 wow. years ago. Yeah, I guess I didn't know that about Portugal. Clearly, they haven't fallen apart. So, all right, well, that's exciting. That's a good backdrop to get into. But to kind of get things started and let people know kind of who you are, where you're coming from, I always like to start with my guest's origin story. We could start at the beginning, maybe go as far back as you want, but just general questions like, you know, did were there any family influences in terms of an interest in mycology or the natural sciences? Maybe talk a little bit about your education and kind of how you found yourself in this in this place where you were totally crazy about mushrooms. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll start uh, as far back to the beginning as, as like how my life has been rounded. And, uh, and I don't tell many people this now that I have a big platform. I, I'm just going to put it out there in the open. I was actually born in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, it's where my mom's side of the family is from, uh, very conservative. We moved to Washington State 
when I was one years old. And uh, part of that had to do with, you know, the culture, uh, being a, a minority as a, as a non-Mormon, uh, but also a job opportunity for my dad. Uh, so I grew up in Washington State uh, in a suburb of Seattle. Uh, and I love my Pacific Northwest roots. I'm very proud of it. Uh, very also proud of uh, living in California and the opportunities here. Right. Uh, and it's silly to me as a, you know, mycologist and mushroom advocate to be, uh, to have left Washington state, uh, which is such a mycophilic and mushroom rich uh, uh, geography. But, um, but yeah, going back to it. So I don't have uh, many like family kind of influences in the mushroom world, you know, and maybe part of me uh, trying to break the mold and, you know, uh, maybe rebel against the status quo as a lot of teenagers uh, do against the, their parents. Uh, you know, maybe I sought mushrooms out uh, as part of my um, upbringing and, and wanting to uh, uh, learn about the world around me. Actually, my, my dad was a staunch uh, atheist to the point where I sought out uh, religion and church uh, from my friends, wow. uh, which you don't hear a lot of. Um, um, oh. You know, my dad would give me uh, the Richard Dawkins uh, God Delusion book uh, to kind of steer me away. And, and my mom's a Unitarian and and not a, like an extremely um, religious person by any means. And and I, I credit my kind of agnostic um, secular upbringing to give me some space. Uh, to explore my mind and my value system, but um, I put a lot of um, put a lot of uh, emphasis in my life around the people around me and my peer group and my friends uh, mm -hmm. being like really uh, like strong companions in this life. I think it was in November of 2007 uh, when uh, you know we were going to my friend's house uh, in Washington uh, and. Uh, we we had smoked some weed and and uh, my friends knew of this mushroom patch and the the funniest thing about it was that it was in a church parking lot uh, <laughs> it was in this kind of like long uh, uh, green area across the street from from my buddy's spot and there were liberty caps growing there uh, uh, liberty caps philosophy semolenciata not probably doing the name justice but uh, it's one of the more potent mushrooms. Uh, it has higher amounts of base cysteine uh, and psilocybin compared to the most common cultivated mushroom, the Psilocybe cubensis. And, right. you know, I was just 17 and, you know, getting high with my friends and I, I ate a handful of these raw mushrooms and just had a good time. You know, it wasn't mind altering that much. You know, the, the colors seemed a little brighter, a little sharper, like high depth. And, you know, I was just having a good time with my friends. And that was my first introduction to my first, uh, like, mushroom experience. And I don't remember, like, the culinary mushrooms I'd eaten before then much right. at all. Uh, but that, I, I kind of call to that experience as maybe not the most defining experience in my life around mushrooms, but it was certainly a, um, one that's important to me, just um, more more or less to do with kind of like where I was coming from uh, as a, as a yeah, youngster. Well, it gives it a really interesting backdrop for the work you're doing now. Uh, you know, my mind starts to go to, you know, maybe the background where you weren't, you didn't have a, a certain kind of spirituality pushed on you or a certain kind of religion pushed on you that maybe you were more open and maybe even seeking a mystical or spiritual experience in your life and were more open to the other avenues through which that could that could come. And I think it's a really common story, what you're talking about, that people's formative experiences with mushrooms are with psychedelic mushrooms. You really can't get around it. You know, I always preface a lot of my work, channels, interviews saying, hey, I don't really get into psychedelics. I have people reach out to me and I tell them it's not really my area of expertise, but it's undeniable that it's an extremely potent experience. Anyone who's experienced psilocybin or psychoactive mushrooms, it's extremely potent and ends up being a transformative experience for almost everybody I've ever talked to. So it's like this undeniable force. You know, I sometimes call them like the ambassadors of the mushroom world that pull people into the greater world of mushrooms and mycology. Uh, so 
it's just really interesting to hear that's the vector that you came through, especially, you know, there's, you have this backdrop of a, of a career in kind of traditional gourmet mushrooms, mushroom cultivation, but your formative experience that pulled you into that world was with psychedelics. So it makes sense that you'd return there and be able to carry a banner for, you know, spreading the knowledge and the therapeutic use of them as a medicine. Thank you. Yeah. I would still emphasize it as a, as a small part of my uh, introduction. And I, I just want to bring up a couple points that I think is important. Uh, mm. First of all, the privilege that I have to, you know, without much fear of, of uh, you know, going to jail and facing um, harsh imprisonment uh, to, you know, eat something that's uh, schedule one. Um, you know, as a, as a white man, I recognize the privilege that I have to, mm. to uh, you know, feel like I can do that without repercussions. Right. Um, the second thing, uh, which I like that you're, you're bringing up is, uh, you know, there's this, um, I think, lack of uh, rites of passage in Western uh, culture that, uh, that I think you're exactly right. I was, I was exploring in, in my time, you know, may have been in my subconscious, like as I was picking these mushrooms from this church and, uh, and not, you know, not sure where it would take me really. Uh, right. it, didn't, it didn't have a super profound effect, but it didn't, you know, not affect me and maybe laid some groundwork, uh, for me, uh, in the future. Uh, but I would attribute some of the biggest kind of influence to me for mushrooms, uh, was, uh, the following year, uh, I, I was 18 and I, I moved down to California. I was enrolled at UC Davis and, uh, before I, uh, signed up for classes, uh, oftentimes you go to your university and you, um, stay there for like a week and. You, you sign up for your classes, you have an orientation leader that's kind of the, you know, maybe they're a sophomore and they're they're showing you the ropes around campus. And I was recommended to take a class called Mushrooms, Molds, and Society. And that, that I would say, really springboarded me into my uh, mycological career. Uh, and uh, besides being like a really fun and very educational class, it was taught by a man named uh, Dr. Thomas Gordon. And he was the plant pathology department chair at the time. Great sense of humor, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, you know, very interesting research. I think he was uh, studying, if he's not still studying, uh, the effects of uh, sudden oak death, um, mm. which actually isn't a fungi, but uh, you know, it's a fungal-like organism, a oomycete. And that really opened my eyes, I think, uh, kind of the education and the knowledge uh, you know, deemed to me to be like very important to pursue. I like that the course was called, you know, Mushrooms, Molds, and Society, mm -hmm. and really the applications of this knowledge of fungi and, and directly, you know, anthropocentric, how it will affect human society, because I think the implications are so far reaching and, um, you know, it's still, and psilocybin mushrooms are certainly a huge, huge part of that, whether it becomes a kind of communion for people who don't feel a greater sense of spirituality. Um, but then, you know, all the applications we were talking about for the show, microremediation, obviously, is a food source. So I'm sure that that opened your eyes to like this huge multitude of ways that yeah. the, the mycelium of information laces out, if you will, across the spectrum of human experience. Uh, so that's that sounds like a really transformative course to take. And that must have then set your course through academia to explore more and more about mushrooms. And I mean, eventually it put you right in, you know, right in the path of the mycology industry where you're there growing tons of mushrooms, all that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to give credit to these lower division courses to really become this uh, introduction and, and very like very much focusing on like the discovery and, and the history and and you can kind of take with it what you will. Uh, I'm sure we talked about psychedelics. We also talked about the uh, Salem witch trials and uh, ergotamine and ergot fungus right. and some of these um, fungi gone wrong for people. Um, I also took another intro class that was very formative to me as well, called Agriculture, Nature, and Society. And 
at the time I was old, I was a poli sci major. Uh, that's what I had been declared. And I had a lot of past experience uh, working on different campaigns. I was an Obama delegate. I canvassed for uh, a senator from, from my state and uh, really thought politics would be the thing to, you know, help change the world. And I think I had this maybe uh, what I've learned now might be like a savior complex around like trying to do good. Uh, right. But I really, really uh, end up focusing more on like holistic um, uh, perspectives around biology and agriculture and, uh, and mycology. And I started taking more and more mycology classes. Uh, I actually took a mushroom cultivation course as part of my minor and learned about uh, amicil, which is the spawn producing arm of Monterey mushrooms. So I actually had a introductory to the kind of um, subsidiary company of the of, of Monterey mushrooms that I worked for later on. I also went to a career fair that there was a representative of Monterey mushrooms uh, that was there. And my friend ended up getting the job I was looking for right out of college as a grower supervisor. He had the same boss ah, as me. And yeah. uh, I, I had a really great time after college, uh, which we can get into. But, uh, you know, I, I was starting to put the puzzle pieces together about, you know, now, you know, and this is kind of what college should prepare you for, right? Is like what you will take, what you will do with that knowledge afterwards. And, and UC Davis actually has a really um, good way of preparing folks for for the uh, outside of academia or, or more academia, if, if that's your pursuit. And, yeah. and UC Davis also does a great job of, of uh, helping students uh, prepare to do good in the community. There's a marker for that that they've been rated at. And then the community being like in California, so the retention rate of Aggies uh, which is agricultural students. That's the mascot of uh, UC Davis, which I'm proud to be one, you know, with my mushroom farming experience. I, I feel like I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to do good, you know, in, in my greater uh, adopted California community. Well, and it's really interesting that that was kind of your ethos was doing greater good. You wanted to get in political sciences. You thought that would be a way to implement positive change in the world. And it really crosses over with this key theme I see a lot of people take away when they get into mushrooms or understanding the extent of how mushrooms can affect human society is there is this hope that, wow, this can really change things. This is a tangible way to improve society, improve economic systems, political systems, cultural systems. There are ways that we can apply fungi that really manifest as change, or at least we can see that potential. So, you know, it's really interesting to me that you started in the political and maybe, you know, the political without the backdrop of something that can tangibly affect these structures, you know, political kind of breaks down to rhetoric and a lot of things that may not implement the physical change. And so when you get inspired by something like mushrooms, which I think is common for most people, people are like, oh, mushrooms are going to save the world. And that comes from a real place of seeing the potential they have to manifest real change. And I think your academic path you just described kind of shows that. And then the nature of you, kind of this altruistic nature of I want to help change things for the better is, is something that ties in perfectly with how we see a lot of people approaching mushrooms now and the, and the possibilities that lie within kingdom fungi. I completely agree. Yeah. I wanted, you know, maybe selfishly wanted to pursue mushrooms, but I think knowing that uh, you're going to have the biggest impact with what you're the most passionate about so that you can speak with some level of, of expertise or experience. And uh, what, what you're, what you were saying, I think one example that I saw uh, kind of in my, my experiences that uh, I wanted to bring up um, shortly was uh Fungi Foundation with uh, Juliana and uh, her work in Chile in yeah. implementing uh, this um, governmental approach to uh, education policy and elevating the discussion and knowledge of, of citizens around uh, fungus and all the good that they do. And definitely a game changer in so many different capacities. You know, we're a, fairly microphobic culture in the United States. And, and um, as we were talking before the, uh, the interview, 
this uh, decriminalized California campaign has been a very big uh, education campaign, if nothing else, um, in elevating the discussion around uh, drug policy and, and natural medicine uh, policy. And I think that's huge because, you know, with if there is a lack of information and education, these things either get ignored or don't get used responsibly, don't get applied to all the areas they could be applied for maximal benefit. So yeah, well, decriminalize CA, that's the perfect springboard to kind of jump into what that means. And I like that you said, if if nothing else, you know, even if the efforts to change laws or policy don't quite go the way you think, at least it's putting it into the public forum and turning on people's brains and getting people talking about this, putting it into the kind of societal milieu of conversation. And I mean, I'm seeing that because I'm in California, I'm in the Bay Area. It's on the tip of people's tongues. Whenever I say the word mushroom, they know about decriminalization. They know about, they have some basis, you know, in mushrooms and what they do, even if it's just from a psychedelic viewpoint. But many people, they may enter through psychedelia, but then they have knowledge about the other applications of mushrooms. So I think it's been a really effective tool to do, uh, to do just that. So I guess, how did decriminalize CA start? Can we talk a little bit about the origins of this? movement, and maybe how it interlocks with some of the other movements. I know you guys, like we said, are focusing on psilocybin mushrooms, but what that landscape looked like and how it, how it came about. Absolutely. Yeah. There's this, uh, this mushroom hype that's going on that you're very familiar with. And right. what we want to do is create this, uh, zeitgeist to this, uh, spirit, uh, that's, that's focused towards, you know, reaching some tangible goals. And so, I had the good fortune uh, while I was working with Myco Works, I got turned on to this uh, Bay Area event at the, the Omni Commons, uh, which houses the counterculture labs, this biohacker space. And Decriminalize Nature, this uh, the separate um, movement uh, that does focus on, on plant medicines and entheogens uh, in the plant uh, kingdom, uh, they hosted a, an amazing event with Bay Area organizations uh, related to psychedelics, uh, related to drug policy, and they had a lot of testimonials. A lot of people took to the stage and talked about their own personal lives and transformation involving entheogens, plant and mushroom medicines, and, and the good that they've uh, experienced and that has uh, happened for them and their families. And uh, I remember after the uh, the testimonial part of it, uh, we had some chance to do like a mixer and, and go around to the different tables. And I was, you know, really uh, excited and impressed by by everyone. And I think I came in as a volunteer with the Psychedelic Society of San Francisco and like helped set mm -hmm. them up uh, with the, the, their table. But I was walking around, I invited a friend and we were walking around and I saw uh, kind of in the corner near the stage, uh, there's a table with a bunch of clipboards and they had different um, areas of focus for the Decriminalized California campaign mm -hmm. and lines for people to fill out their names and information, contact information. And what I saw was that there were a lot of blank spaces on these clipboards and uh, to me, uh, I had this kind of call to action of, uh, you know, all these people are doing great things and then decriminalized California is here and they, it looks like they really need some help. Right. Uh, and yeah. I'm a kind of a big supporter of the underdog, uh, whoever they may be, <laughs> you know, I think that comes from maybe going to baseball games with my dad and, you know, seeing your home team lose and, uh, you know, still rooting for them till the very end. Right. And, uh, and I also thought that this would be a good opportunity for me to get involved in uh, in the political space once again. Yeah, uh, actually having some uh, policy experience when I was in Santa Cruz uh, while I was working for Monterey Mushrooms. In my free time, I was working with uh, volunteering for an organization called Project Pollinate, and I helped author and pass a resolution banning glyphosate by city employees and city contractors. Uh, to help prevent, uh, you know, the use of this uh, known carcinogen uh, labeled by the World Health Organization uh, and really focusing on, on the health impact that it has, uh, not just for people, but for pollinator health as well. 
And so I have started to get back into the political realm, uh, moved to the uh, Bay Area, moved to Berkeley for, uh, for my work with Michael Works. And so I found myself with a little bit of free time. You know, I like to go to these events and, and listen and, and kind of understand where people are coming from. And so I saw my opportunity. And so I think it was actually either the next day, it was a weekday or, or a couple of days after uh, there was this, um, uh, this meeting in San Rafael, kind of in your neck of the woods. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, it, was, it was a small gathering, maybe like 30 folks, uh, largely from that meeting uh, with decriminalized nature people. And it was like the foundation of decriminalized California. Uh, the campaign, the now campaign director, Ryan uh, Minivar, uh was there. He had been scheming independently about psilocybin decriminalization. And mm -hmm. uh, we kind of like learned where people were at. I actually had a conversation with Ryan then. And uh, and that's who I'm in quarantine with now. And he loves buddy. to ask people, uh, which I think you'd appreciate this uh, kind of interview question, get to know uh, someone about the top 10 foods that you would take with you or grow in a space station, you know, if, if you were to leave earth, like what, what 10 uh, plant or mushroom uh, organisms would, would you bring with you? And I, like I thought, it. you know, it's an interesting question. I, I like yeah. uh, entertaining those questions. And uh, um, anyways, I kind of learned the structure and uh, what if little any um, hierarchy existed within the campaign uh, as it stood at that moment and and kind of from there uh, incrementally got more involved you know started telling my friends about uh, the campaign uh, and there wasn't any um, defined language at that point you know there was more okay. of an idea there was uh, this um, intention that there would be a state campaign uh, you know, maybe in, in conjunction with uh, the city resolutions, uh, we wanted to run an initiative uh, just to, you know, differentiate these things. An initiative is is put to a vote. Uh, you collect signatures to get it on a ballot. Uh, this is what we, uh, this is what happened in Denver. Uh, yeah. Decriminalized DC also took this approach, although they've had to suspend their campaign uh, given uh, the pandemic. And right. uh, um, and so just to differentiate, so Oakland passed the resolution. Uh, yeah. I was going to, I was going to say, so are the city, you're saying resolutions, that's different than what you're trying to do on the state level with an initiative. So those are kind of in parallel. It's not like once you get a critical mass of all the cities you're in, the state has to say, all right, you guys win. Or may, maybe that happens too, but it's like a separate initiative. It's a separate uh, uh, campaign. Actually, yeah, the opposite can happen. So with cannabis, with Prop 64, you have state legislation, uh, but then it goes back to the, uh, you know, and they are saying like, okay, we're opening the space up now, but yeah. it, they actually framed it in a way that the cities could, and cities and counties could change that policy. And so why we see about 75% of counties in California actually uh, putting, like putting a ban on dispensaries, cultivation, right. uh, you know, sales essentially, and actually uh, really diminishing access to... Um, that was confusing. So it sounds like doing both then, I mean, you guys working in conjunction with the city campaigns would be the way to make sure we're all kind of on the same page yeah. across the state. For sure. And uh, another important note that I think people don't appreciate is that, you know, even with the decriminalization effort succeeding in the Oakland City Council and in the Santa Cruz City Council, which I was there for a uh, very you know, exciting day and, and, and had helped those folks uh, a little bit, uh, but really they were the, the leaders in that this independent, uh, you know, decriminalized nature, very decentralized. But even with these successes on a city level, you can have the county officials and the state officials uh, you know, not to mention, well, we should mention the, the federal officials coming in and, and putting a stop to any of that. And so city resolutions passing is great. It's not as powerful as an initiative when it's really like the, the citizens that are uniting, you know, with the resolutions or ordinances um, or referendums. You have a small 
group of representatives, uh, you know, elected officials making those decisions for you. But without the state and even without the federal legislation, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, changed, you right. can still put an end to these these city resolutions. That have been and, passed. and so those don't necessarily translate into quote unquote laws. But what happens at the city level is that an interpretation of a state or federal law, and some of this is my own ignorance of the political system, okay, yeah. uh, but that's that's what I hope to kind of clarify now is when decriminalized movements are getting passed at the city level, is that affecting actual or is that uh, implementing actual legislation just applicable to that city? Um, and then at the state level, is that the same thing? Because I've always been confused with how, oh, it's still, you know, it's still illegal federally. So, I mean, right. you just reference the example of cannabis, it's still illegal federally. So right. there's all kinds of issues that come with that. So how do these things all jive together? I mean, how do these regulations and initiatives, how does that translate into, you know, law or, or how we can interpret it? Right. It's objectively confusing. And it's yeah. also a privilege to have time and resources to dive into it, uh, which is a huge bar for most people. And totally. why we've seen it, like, even people you want to be supporting you, you know, not even taking the time to read the resolution. It's, it's only eight pages, you know, it's not a, or sorry, the initiative. See, I, I'm, I'm already stumbling over the words. So, so it's, it's objectively confusing. I think preface any of these conversations, you know, it's important to, to um, kind of talk about uh, the privilege of, of understanding. And, uh, and so you're, I like the way you put it with the uh, interpretation of, of like the laws, because it's, uh, it's still a gray area going back to what we were talking about before, you know, we've got like, what we have now is like a black market uh, for uh, magic mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Santa Cruz and in Oakland, you kind of have a, a, a slightly less, you know, black, slightly gray market, but it's, it's still, you know, illegal on the county, you know, books, uh, you know, in the state policy or you know, legislation. And, and federally. So you've got kind of these like layers, like an onion um, of, of work that needs to be done to ensure kind of the uh, efficacy and uh, uh, effectiveness of these political movements, which is, you know, another kind of call to action to be involved in state uh, initiatives. You right. know, when, you put, when you put the power into the people and the, the majority of people making a decision, it's very hard for you know, our elected representatives to then say, well, no, 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 like this is actually not going to happen, though, even though the majority of people want it. And, and you know, actually, we have seen that the majority of people do uh, want decriminalization. So, uh, so uh, going back to the, the language, so we have uh, th three uh, things that a city can do. And the resolution is actually the least powerful among them. Oh, and okay. you've got referendums and you've got ordinances, which go a little bit more beyond a resolution. And within these decriminalization campaigns, all you're saying, you're not actually changing the law. You're just saying that this becomes the smallest priority of law enforcement. And as it should, right? Okay, so that that was a, an obvious question too: is what does decriminalization mean versus legalization? So when you get it, so when there is something passed to mandate a substance as decriminalized, that just means it's not pursued by local law enforcement. It, it shouldn't be, and and you may still have you know some police chief. Uh, some you know police officer arresting you for for your money. So that could still happen in things. Oakland, in Santa absolutely, Cruz. Absolutely, okay. and I, this is a very important thing. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that the the doors are wide open to grow. You know, the biggest mushroom grow up. You know, I, I have people <laughs> asking me like maybe they ask you about like growing mushrooms and like they look to me and my experience with Monterey and they see these you know trays and upon trays upon trays you know thousands of mushrooms growing and they're like oh let's do that for for cubenzies you know i'm like yeah no 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 let's 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 take this one cool step yes. at a time yeah and, you know as fun and as exciting as that could be uh it's actually very uh irresponsible and so mm -hmm. uh what we need to do is pass a statewide initiative uh to change uh the policy and to change the law 
And so what Decriminalize California does is actually goes into it uh, and make, gets as close to legalization as possible, mm. uh, but it is still decriminalization. And then the other kind of word to throw out and you can get into it is uh, medicalization and right. an approach towards, uh, you know, uh, you know, regulating it, but putting it into the hands of of medical professionals and kind of the pharmaceutical industry. But yeah, it looks like well, you have a question. I was just going to say, I, I'm always wondering if these three paths are at cross purposes, if they run in parallel, do they go together to build the same thing? You know, are they mutually exclusive, basically the medicalization versus the decriminalization versus the legalization? And I guess we can look at cannabis where it went the medicalization route and now it's gone the legalization route. So they can clearly both happen, but I guess, and the reason I ask that is I've had, I've heard critiques in the Bay area say, oh, well, decriminalization, what we really need is legalization or other people say, no, we don't want legalization. That puts it in like a commercial framework that will be deleterious to the overall use of these. So even that landscape between I think what we're seeing is three paths to putting a substance to, uh, to make a substance more accessible so you don't get thrown in a cage for having, you know, a natural substance. These three paths, what are the relationships? Maybe, you know, that's probably a huge conversation unto itself, but maybe a little bit of differences between those three and why you think decriminalize is, is the push that we should make right now. Right. Yeah, no, this is a great uh, topic of conversation. And I'm really glad that, uh, that you're having me on to discuss it, um, you know, as as uh, kind of rudimentary as we can get. But, uh, well, me too, because to I need to know. Yeah, we all need to know. This is a very important conversation. Uh, but I'll add that uh, cannabis started with Prop 215 and being decriminalized. But moving be before okay. that, you know, we've had this war on drugs where, you know, it's been a, it's still a schedule one. Uh, you know, drug, you know, in the eyes of the federal government. And so before that, even uh, it wasn't as um, it wasn't banned, it wasn't prohibited. And and so we're that's kind of a very important context for for any of these conversations is that we are, you know, in the midst, you know, still of, of a drug war uh, that's, right. you know, objectively racist, uh, targeting pe uh, people of color and uh, and you know it's it's a privilege again to be working in this space and and trying to affect change. But uh, yeah, so the, this is this is getting into the nitty gritty of like what people's values are. Uh, I've also been privileged to sit in uh, the room in a meeting with the co-founder of Compass Pathways, uh, that's involved in uh, you know many ongoing medical trials. They have a patent on a, a biosynthetic product of psilocybin. Uh, they've helped. Uh, get, you know, this information available uh, so that the FDA has now deemed psilocybin as a, you know, breakthrough therapy, uh, right. specifically for treatment resistant depression. Um, and, and so as, you know, as a scientist, as an individual, I, and I, I support medical trials ongoing. I support the science. I, I, I support, you know, all the discoveries that are being made uh, in in the space of psychedelics and medicine, um, you know, even analogs are are interesting and exciting to me. The work that Dave Nichols uh, is doing, uh, very interesting. Um, that said, um, what a lot of people, including myself, uh, find to be uh, you know very important is that uh, magic mushrooms. You know, the simple you know, mushroom that grows like in people's closets if they're cultivating illegally, uh, if they're growing in a, that church green space parking lot area with the Liberty Cats that I ate. These wild mushrooms and cultivated mushrooms, these mushrooms that have been a part of tradition and rituals for millennia have very potent, uh, pow you know, very potent effects, very powerful effects. Uh, and and have improved the lives of so many. You can find testimonials all over the internet. You know, our volunteers are, are kind of outpouring with their uh, support of I it. I mean, it's relatively ubiquitous. Everyone who I've ever heard talk about their experience, there's a greater sense of connection with something larger than yourself. There's a greater understanding of the oneness 
that we all share as people. There's a greater, I mean, I, I had a guest on Ian Geithner who worked in a Roland Griffiths lab at Johns Hopkins. Uh, talk, and, and I had this similar discussion. We went into it briefly about, you know, the medical examination process approval for the FDA versus decriminalization. Uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I think he thought that he would prefer going the FDA route first before you enter it into this, you know, area where everyone has access. And his whole point was, I want to make sure we have the most thorough and comprehensive understanding that we can. But, you know, from his research, the anecdotal experiences and reports and things he he had seen was that it was almost, you know, there were a tremendous percentage of positive experiences versus any potentially negative. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's huge anecdotal evidence. My whole thing was, I, I totally appreciate too ex the examination under kind of a rigorous academic and clinical setting to make sure we are finding out exactly what these substances, in many cases, analogs, you know, synthetically derived psilocybin, but what the effects are on the human brain, on the human body, especially when you talk about follow-up testing. Like I'm all for that. I just don't see why it can't be coupled with the general, and maybe that's why decriminalization is so good is it doesn't just say, hey, it's free reign. But couple that with not throwing people in cages, especially when it seems to focus on disadvantaged communities. So to me, that move to do the medicalization and the research to really suss these out as therapies and figure out the absolute most efficient and best ways to use them, and that idea of putting this on the lowest rung for any kind of law enforcement to say this is not worth going after, this is not worth ruining people's lives over. But yeah, I see them working together very um very much hand in hand. And that's the, exactly. And that's the sentiment that uh, I had in that meeting with uh, the co-founder of Compass Pathways. And they're and, a little bit controversial. I've, I've heard people bring up things with them. Oh, yeah. Too. I'll, we'll get into that. And, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and I don't want to preface maybe this part of saying that this medicine is, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, is not for everyone. And e there is even some pushback to calling it a medicine because it's been spiritually uh, by people all over the world, you know, specifically also in Central America, uh, where, you know, uh, kind of the uh, introduction of it into Western culture started uh, with right. the BNN and Dr. Wasson. But um, uh, what I'm, so yeah, we are all for medical research here. Uh, we uh, even have part of our language that goes into uh, you know, that in a clinical setting, you know, this is something that should be practiced by uh, trained uh, therapists, psychologists, you know, licensed professionals, right? And uh, I had a question, you know, I like to think of questions also, you know, from my uh, radio background. And I would say, you know, like, where does that research end, right? Like, we have all this anecdotal evidence, we have the millennia of uh, traditional spiritual experiences with this. Uh, psychoactive mushrooms are all over the world, uh, every continent except for Antarctica. And, and when does it end? You know, when, does, when is science satisfied uh, with this, right? And so I think what uh, I like to bridge uh, from this conversation, I'm getting kind of like some goosebumps right now thinking about it, a uh, little deja vu action, maybe, uh, but it's uh, it goes to like the reality of our medical and pharmaceutical uh, industries, um, and and what is going on in the world with that, and and maybe the question to people is like, do you trust the pharmaceutical industry? Do you are you satisfied with the medical care that you are giving? Uh, do you appreciate? Uh, do you find it affordable? Uh, do you find it accessible? And if the answer to any of those are no, then decriminalization might be for you, right? And uh, and it goes back to kind of this like trust in the mushrooms themselves and also the trust in people. Uh, I, you know, we get to a certain age in our life, uh, you know, our society says that age is 18, uh, that we become an adult. Right, and we have right. to. We have a higher responsibility at that age, um, and uh, and we have, um, you know, you know, life. You know, like you're kind of forced to uh, to be, uh, you know, taking life on your own. You know, hopefully your parents have been there to help 
uh, guide you and help instill some values uh, so that if psychedelics come into your world, uh, you'll take them respons- uh, uh, with some responsibility. And it's the, it's the realm of personal responsibility that we expect everyone moves into where, I mean, even legally, you are responsible for your own actions. Why would this be any different? Right. And why we've had a lot of support from uh, the libertarian community. Uh, my dad has, was actually a libertarian. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, this is this is something that uh, I think is definitely worthy of conversation because it moves kind of past the, the biology and the kind of like science and medicine uh, and and into the realm of like people. And, you know, where do you like how do you uh, perceive others in this? And I think there's a certain level of trust that you have to have in your fellow human to make some of the right decisions for themselves. Obviously, we don't want uh, people under 18 taking this. Uh, even, you know, science is telling us that our brains are still developing at 25. My mom will tell me, uh, she's in a uh, medical profession, that at 40, your brain is still forming. Uh, so you shouldn't be taking too many things that will affect your brain at that time. Um, but you know, a lot of people, and then another thing is a lot of people are in dire need of something besides what they have. Uh, a lot of people are facing, uh, PTSD. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, dealing with addiction, um, anxiety, all things that, uh, we know, uh, have been alleviated with mushrooms and, and the time, you know, was way back in the past for this to be available uh, to people. And again, it's because it's been prohibited in this war on drugs that you know we're, we're talking about it, right? And, uh, and so I think that the historical context uh, of the drug war and then the historical context of the spiritual and traditional use of it uh, is all very important. And then the kind of the timing of like, you know, this is something that needs to happen now uh, and we have the opportunity as uh, as citizens in the state to support the campaign I'm working on of uh, decriminalized California and uh, and the various decriminalized nature um, um, campaigns that are going on throughout the world, uh, which I'm I'm also very much in support of. Um, you know, and I I hope to see more cross collaboration and support in the psychedelic communities when when I haven't really seen that, unfortunately, I think people are kind of afraid to put their name to decriminalize California for one reason or another. Um, and I, I also am afraid that uh, kind of the perspectives people have uh, in this community come from a place of privilege and also a kind of, and ignorance and also mistrust of people. And, and I, again, I preface this by saying that uh, I don't think this is for everyone. And you already see people abusing uh, drugs, whether it's mushrooms or another thing uh, right now. And with more access, perhaps you would see uh, that happen uh, more so. But you can't have the, you know, policy and kind of state support in the medical system until you have decriminalization. And if you go with the route of medicalization, you are creating an, an, a huge bottleneck for access. Uh, oftentimes, this will also not even be the mushroom itself. It will be a synthetic uh, psilocybin dosage uh, that is patented by uh, some group in the pharmaceutical industry that stands to profit immensely. And so if you want to give profit to the pharmaceutical industry, go for medicalization. If you trust the medical system as it is and the pharmaceutical industry as it is, go with medicalization. If you trust uh, your peers, if you trust uh, disenfranchised communities to make uh, you know, these decisions and, and for community support and education, uh, then we need to pass decriminalization so that, first of all, no more people go to jail for this. You know, they're not put behind, uh, you know, uh, they're not in cages anymore, and uh, and this decriminalization will also open up research uh, for for more professionals to get into this space. It's not impossible to do that right now uh, through the uh, the FDA. Uh, you know, it's a simple like eight page form, like simple you know, from someone who's educated in pharmaceutical 
you know, the medical system, but, um, right, right. but it's not accessible to most people. And so uh, we're um, in our initiative, I'm also proud. Uh, so it goes into sales and it would create um, to some degree an industry around this. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, we want people who have been convicted of mushroom related offenses to have their records expunged and to get out of jail. That's huge because that's been something, you know, when you talk about disenfranchised people or people of less resource, they get kind of the boot of the law when it comes to psychedelic mushrooms. And I think what you were just talking about, I kind of let you go because you brought up so many great aspects to this conversation. And I really resonated with what you were talking about, things that I hadn't thought of before with the medical path. Uh, and it brought up, I was just writing some notes here. Are there other, you know, there are so many other substances that we still study on a routine basis that aren't necessarily criminal. So does something have to have the gatekeeper of prohibition, you know, in place forever until we've completely mapped out what the substance does? It just as like kind of a funny example, I mean, how, many, how much research do I see coming out on coffee if it's good for you, if it's bad for you, if it's... But it's still completely legal. We all drink it, even though the scientists are always disagreeing about what it does. So I really like that of where does it end? You know, where does the actual analysis of this in a clinical setting lead you to a place where you can say, okay, 100% safe for absolutely everybody. Now we can lift prohibition. And I think an interesting conversation with that is, um, is prohibition actually an effective gatekeeping mechanism? We have the example of alcohol prohibition in our own country showing that it's absolutely not. This is always for people who are veterans of kind of the, the marijuana movement. Uh, obviously, veterans of this movement will know all those arguments about why prohibition doesn't work, the examples of why it doesn't work, and where when it's lifted, society does not fall apart. So, you know, what gatekeeping mechanism do we have as a society to ensure responsible use of any substance. And it kind of comes back to cultural backdrops, a lot of times too, spiritual backdrops, when you, especially when you talk about mushroom use. It's something that's inculcated in the society and it is it becomes kind of a rite of passage to have an explanation and even potentially an exploration of these substances that is guided by other people within the community, not necessarily through any kind of legal framework. You know, when you talk about some of the South American uh, cultures that have used mushrooms, there isn't a judge, there isn't a scientist. I mean, there's kind of a shaman figure and that's a whole other archetype to get into, but there's kind of a cultural insubstantiation of these structures that don't really have one set category, but that all have the goal of ensuring the knowledge and the responsible use of these substances is passed on. And in our own culture, we have that for things as simple as like fat and sugar. Kids are told that how bad for you that is or how to use it responsibly. Or how... So, you know, we need to get out of this mindset that there's ever going to be one central authority that is going to deem these substances as completely safe or that's going to put out, you know, the government's going to put out a list of how that, God, I hope not. Um, we have to put trust in some of the other systems of society to meet out and determine responsible use and ensure that it isn't getting into the hands of people that shouldn't have it, you know, parents or any kind of caregiver, making sure that someone who's too young or just has mental, you know, uh, stability issues where this might not be a good thing for them to take are ensuring that they don't get their hands on it. But that's something that's nebulous. You know, it's hard for people to latch onto that as the definitive. And it's like, well, you know, we have to put it into the personal responsibility of communities and individuals to be able to handle these substances in a way that is safe and responsible. And maybe that is through, you know, we develop a spiritualized context for these things. I've seen that be very successful when you talk about other plant medicines, a spiritual kind of backdrop and framework for these things helps establish the boundaries of what one person can handle, helps establish the boundaries for responsible use, helps them get support from a community of other people. Because that's the other thing. If you have the stigmatized and, and prohibited, you know, you lose that all important peer group in assessing how to manage these substances. There should be an area where there's kind of the spiritual and recreational use still has a place other than strictly medical. And that's just my own thinking of it, having experience dealing with people who have used it, and also coming from a place, like you said, where I don't trust pharmaceutical companies 
at all. So I wouldn't inherently say, oh, well, we'll trust it to them to mete out responsible use. I can't trust the people in my community. I can't trust that there's any kind of greater societal gatekeeping mechanism that we would all autonomously configure just by our use of it. You know, there has to be a pharma pharmaceutical company or government agency. And I, so I think that, you know, what you're describing in decriminalization clears the path for us to develop our own community and greater cultural systems of dealing with these substances, setting the norms and everything else. <clears throat> and it doesn't invalidate testing and examination. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up that it can, they, they can coexist, right? Uh, a couple of words that came to me were, you know, de decentralizing these efforts and then uh, focusing on the regenerative community. And, uh, and I don't think that's, you know, at the focus of our, uh, of our nation, of, of, of GDP, you know, of, uh, <laughs> you know, of our economy, uh, you know, also going to medicine and how pharmaceuticals are developed, you know, we don't really look at uh, natural products or like whole plant, whole uh, mushroom, uh, you know, medicine, you know, we look at, right you know, extracts or biosynthesized versions of it, which is totally counter to uh, kind of Eastern medicine and more holistic healing uh, approaches. You know, uh, we spend more money on uh, erectile dysfunction drugs than probably <laughs> anything else, you know, and if we had a fraction of that for uh, natural products or mushrooms, you know, we'd be in a lot better place. Uh, also, you know, uh, talking about like authorities, uh, the kind of uh, the society of like, uh, like the United Nations and like kind of the, the bigger community uh, has looked at drugs and there's a global drug survey uh, that's been published uh, routinely and uh, mushrooms, you know, psilocybin is at the bottom of that list of, you know, lethality, you know, it's, wow. it's the safest drug to take where yeah. like cigarettes and alcohol which are advertised, you know, in this and, and focused on uh, is, is, uh, is, you know, at the top of the list of, of really killing people. So it shows you like what our priorities are. And, and there is this element of, of profit to be made. And if without, um, without uh, decriminalization, uh, you, <laughs> you know, the pharmaceutical industry stands profit immensely not just from the dosage, but the, the therapy that goes along with it, where with decriminalization, you know, people could grow mushrooms in their closet for pennies on the dollar, you know, you're converting grain, you know, which is a <laughs> dollar per pound or less, you know, with their bio, with the mushrooms biological efficiency, you know, sometimes exceeding a hundred percent and, and turning that into, you know, mushroom medicine and, Obviously, you shouldn't take a pound of mushrooms at a time, but you could and you wouldn't die from it, you know, yeah. where like smoking a pound of cigarettes or drinking a pound of alcohol may actually kill you. So uh, it just shows you like the priorities that we have. And if you and listen to Kalindi E, that may actually show <laughs> you the fabric of the universe. I, I heard him speak uh, and uh, yeah, really potent stuff, you know, be prepared to uh, to go to the bathroom a bunch of times <laughs> if you're <laughs> taking 20 grams, uh, 30 grams, you know, some uh, exorbitant amount. Um, but but you know, I'm not, you know, it's not my position to tell them not to take that much. Right. You know, and I, right. I, I'm in this, this fight, this political battle uh, to, you know, to allow for people to have those experiences because they are so important. And, and they're, and like you're saying, they're valid. Like this doesn't only have to be in a medical context. And when you shove it into that context, people who do have a spiritual practice with it, you know, where do they go? They have to get some kind of falsified prescription and do like, do we really yeah. need to do that kind of system? Is that really, um, and you know, it's something you mentioned before, there's such deep roots in a lot of these practices. How do we then as Westerners come in and invalidate that and put our own gatekeeping on it? when there's there's already a legacy of how to handle these things and how to use these things so i mean you're i'm sure you walk a tightrope in between people's belief systems people's fears about you know uh, uh psychedelic psilocybin mushrooms we were talking about right before the show i think starting those conversations with people is the only way 
we'll figure out any commonality or address the concerns is, you know, what are the base level concerns? So I guess what I want to get a handle on is kind of where decriminalize CA is now, how you're managing some of these conversations and how you're trying to put it to state lawmakers. Yeah, and thank you again for this platform to, to talk about it because, uh, yeah, it is a very tight rope and uh, you're a very uh, generous interviewer. And uh, I've, and it's not, I, it's not commonplace. It's not, uh, I don't have the easiest conversations with people. I've, we've been slighted by, um, you know, people with very little um, knowledge or influence in the community and, and people with very great influence in the community. And, and it's rather upsetting to be ignored. Uh, you know, that's the biggest thing. Uh, you know, we can have conversations all day about our values. And if we can, if we can do that and just kind of like understand where we fall in this uh, conversation, like that I consider a win, even if you don't agree with decriminalization. Uh, right, but right. I've had a lot of these conversations and I have been able to win over a lot of people um, you know, uh, Mike Pollan has his book, uh, not to elevate his status anymore, but uh, how to change your mind. Uh, you know, right. I can't change your mind for you, but I can at least present, uh, you know, perspectives, the facts, uh, you know, knowledge, and just like my my own energy in this uh, arena. Uh, but yeah, where we are right now, uh, what is today, April, like third or fourth, the days are blending together right now. And it is for a lot of people uh, with this, uh, pandemic i know you don't want to talk about it too much uh and it is <laughs> well we can't ignore it it's kind of dominating the world right now so. it, right yeah no it's it's severely impacted the campaign uh you know we were ramping up our, uh, our campaign you know that has over a thousand volunteers about a uh, 1500 wow. now uh throughout the state and all counties of california uh to not only uh, do uh, signature collecting uh, like farmers markets uh, at different events, uh, but a number of brick and mortar locations to go to, uh, you know, and it's on our website uh, to sign the petitions. Uh, probably a number of them are closed now. And, uh, and then they, those brick and mortars have trained employees uh, to be able to answer some questions to help uh, fill out those petitions and then send them uh, to our, our central location, our headquarters, which is uh, this apartment in Hollywood uh, that I'm quarantined in. And, uh, and so this is a, a major blow to the campaign and it could be uh, not, not sound too bleak, but a fatal blow, uh, at least this go around. And uh, so right now uh, we've had a kind of a, um, a series of events that have, uh, you know, held on to the summer optimism. I'm an optimistic person just in general. That can't be taken away from me with the pandemic. <laughs> it's, it's the way to be. It's the only way to survive. Right. Uh, certainly. So what we're working on right now is lobbying uh, the state and um, legislators to do an online petition and signature collecting campaign. And so we have a website uh, up on change.org forward slash I sign digitally. And this is uh, an open letter to uh, Governor Newsom, uh, the State Attorney General Alex Padilla, uh, and, and another person who I'm forgetting, uh, to ask them uh, for either two options moving forward. One would be to have our uh, signature collecting go digitally. And there's great um, uh, platforms for that, like DocuSign, where sure. businesses are and homes and loan payments are, you know, funneled through and, and done online digitally. Uh, you know, sometimes millions of dollars getting exchanged through. Uh, so right now, you need manual, kind of, as they call, it, wet signatures of people in person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Seems a little ridiculous in the digital age, but okay. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we'll get into it a little bit more. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up. And, and yeah, so it's, it is, and this is another part of the education of, of policy now is that this is a citizen's initiative. And as such, we need to collect, it's a percentage of the population that voted in the last election. And we have uh, the requirement for any citizen's initiative. Uh, you know, if you have, if you cared about, uh, let's say, like uh, the state mushroom, uh, 
uh, which is probably going to go through the legislative process. But if you wanted to, you know, corral uh, the people to, you know, go through an initiative for this election cycle, it would be 623,212 signatures, uh, wow. which is a lot. A lot. Uh, it's, I think more so than any other in, in the state. And also bring, uh, bring up a good point, which is not every state has a citizen's initiative and is actually, you know, to some degree under attack and in a fragile thing that as a, you know, democratic citizen, you know, we need to preserve uh, even in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, you know, there's, there's a big threat in, in our uh, democracy right now of, of liberties being taken away and going through this, uh, you know, uh, election cycle. And, you know, with good reason, we need to, you know, socially distance ourselves and, uh, and encourage other people to do the same. Uh, and, uh, and so it's actually, I wanted to bring up, uh, just moving back real quick, uh, you're talking about like, you know, the, the community approach and actually uh, Governor Newsom has, has done a good job, I would say, in, in talking about uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer pressuring of of the kind of social norm that we're in now, and 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 emphasizing social distancing. And I bring him up because he also, in his uh, autobiography or biography, I may have had like a shadow writer write it. Uh, he actually called for uh, the the need to reform this process and and looking at the digital age that we're living in and incorporating that into our democracy uh, and in the election system. And so uh, you can actually read this and, and we've used this now uh, to implore, you know, like, remember what you wrote, like you've got your name and face. Come on, governor, you know, this is the right thing to do. Give the people control over the systems that dictate their lives. Come on. Yeah, exactly. And, he, and he's kind of a product of San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley, uh, and and got a lot of friends in this this community, and this this is turning into now a, kind of a, a bigger issue. You know, we started with mushrooms, but now you know we've been forced to kind of pursue this path towards uh, you know accessibility in our election system right. and democracy. And this is an even bigger appeal. So the Change.org petition is open to anyone, uh, whether they live in California or a registered voter or not. Uh, anyone can sign that. So this is uh, something that uh, we are pushing right now. Uh, we have, I think, five of the other initiatives on board to support this. And uh, so we're building a coalition of people that care about this. Uh, and so these are initiatives that aren't necessarily based in psychoactive, any, just other citizen initiatives precisely. pushing to make sure that citizens can actually participate in the initiatives in a way that's not too cumbersome. So you've moved from just an initiative to decriminalize to having to put together a framework to say, look, we need more accessibility to even vote on these kind of citizen proposed initiatives. Exactly. Um, on that topic, I was a little embarrassed to learn that there is a pesticide uh, initiative to reform pesticides. And like, as I mentioned, I was involved in that in Santa Cruz. Yeah. And so, you know, that's another one that I want people to support. Uh, there's a couple of ones related to uh, cannabis, uh, other uh, kind of reforms in our in our uh, issues that people uh, really care about. Like we need those to be more accessible. I, I know a lot of people listening don't want glyphosate. They want easier access to or at least decriminalization. So these are issues that people really, really are passionate about. So, yeah, I think developing or your push to make this more accessible for people to support you know, is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we want to live in this digital age. Uh, you know, there's reasons like cybersecurity that, you know, people can bring up, but uh, there's a lot of systems in place, uh, you know, through that can be verified, whether it's through the Department of Motor Vehicles, whether it's through your social security number, uh, right. bank statements, uh, you know, resident uh, addresses and, and this, that and the other thing. Uh, that can be used to help verify your identity and then make this process accessible to people. You know, go, you know, sharing with the uh, the magic mushroom uh, decriminalization campaign. You know, we're all about like accessibility and and learning what that means for people and promoting that. And uh, and I, now I'm like supercharged because this is a new issue. It's something that I also care about. A lot of people 
uh, if they don't support mushroom decriminalization, they will support, uh, you know, living in the digital age and, and having our democracy reflect that, uh, including the governor. So uh, if he's listening, uh, you know, let's uh, let's turn this on. Um, uh, the other, just uh, going back to the, uh, the letter, the other thing that we uh, also asked for, so we had two asks, one was for this, uh, uh, three month extension plus the the digital signature collecting. So sorry, right. that's one point. The second point would just to be putting these initiatives on the ballot because we still have to vote on them, right? The signature collecting is just to you know show the state that there is enough people, which like you know arguably doesn't need to exist, uh, but it does. Uh, and and then the real test is if. 50% of the population plus one will actually vote in, in support of it. Right. And that is kind of, that, that will tell, that, that is the, the second, uh, you know, hurdle that we have to pass. Um, and so you have to that, get enough knowledge built up and enough people just to support the idea. Not necessarily they agree with it, but this is something that everyone should be able to vote on and decide um, if it's even worthy of putting into the political arena and then it actually shows up on our ballots and then everyone can actually vote on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is really interesting structural stuff that, you know, I'm a little divorced from. And I know a lot of people are divorced from their area because, you know, government and politics are kind of a, a purview of those who do have enough resource to really be able to back up for a second and look at it, which is fantastic. And I'm glad there are people that are looking at it and like you are breaking it down to this incredibly approachable level because it's really the only power we have, especially in an era where less people trust government than ever. It's the only power we have to have any control over, over those systems that, I mean, run, run our lives ostensibly. hundred percent. So with a digital online signature collecting uh, process for, for the, the ballot for signature collecting or, or the, the voting itself, it actually elevates everyone's, democratic power you know that yeah we have. absolutely me, like what's more important than that like more more important than mushrooms and i'm like a career mycologist at this well point. that's a big statement <laughs> that's a big statement coming from you now what is the current deadline you guys have to amass your critical uh, uh quanta of signatures it's april 21st so oh that's coming up yeah. fast yeah and it's around uh two important holidays to folks uh, bicycle day uh, and uh, April 20th, so April 20th oh, yeah. is, is a big one, um, and we need as much support, so thank you again for this platform to talk about it. Well, it sounds like one of the biggest pushes, too, that people can make, and we're going to link this all up on the podcast, and we may actually move up your release date just to keep it relevant. You know, I generally tell people there's like a six or seven week lag before it gets released, but I think because this is pertinent, there is a deadline, we should probably move it up, uh, and a big thing is for people to try to spread the word or support maybe on change.org some of these initiatives or maybe even you know maybe phone i'm sure the state's office with the whole pandemic is just a nightmare but let them know hey we need to take this digital and we need to extend this one ballot initiative now let's say worst case scenario april 21st comes i mean you've started great conversations you've put this in the arena there's no loot there's no loss here but let's say you don't hit that critical mass of signatures when is the next time you can just pick up and, and start the charge again? Yeah, so we actually have a small extension already built in uh, without the uh, digital you know, side of it. Of the okay. Mac. Uh, so what, what would happen, I think it's like three months extra, uh, and it would be uh, in 2021 that there would be a special election uh, uh, with a special ballot uh, that people would vote on. And that would be in an off-season election cycle uh, not great. Like right now is great because a lot of people will be turning out to vote uh, for right. this presidential election in 2022 uh, when we can have this run again. If we fail to reach the signatures with that built in extension, uh, we'd be running into a more like conservative election cycle. You know, more people uh, of a particular conservative persuasion vote in the off uh, presidential election, you know, in, in uh, 2022. So we want to pass it now. Uh, that's why we are kind of gearing towards the, the digital signature collecting, because just given where we're at in society, uh, that's what we have at our, um, you know, disposal is, is, is focusing on this. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I, I understand and I appreciate that uh, whether it's mushrooms or digital signature collecting uh, these and or any political movement, you know, these are not issues that are at the top of people's priorities when we have uh, a lot of people getting laid off, you know, record unemployment numbers, right, right. About, uh, you know, getting health care and staying safe and healthy. Uh, so I, I definitely respect that. We, we're also, you know, kind of uh, in this captive audience uh, stage where, you know, everyone's at home or, you know, a lot of people are at home, you know, a lot of respects to the uh, essential workers and the, the healthcare workers that are on the front lines of this. Uh, but we, a lot of people are, you know, taking Zoom calls uh, for meetings and, and whatnot uh, and have, you know, some time to, to see this, you know, in their news feed or, you know, pursue it. But, um, but I, I also just want to say that it's not in everyone's uh, motivation or um, attention span and, and focus right now. So, totally. uh, you know, we're going to push hard because that's what we're, what we're doing and we don't, we want to continue keeping the momentum going, but there's some realities that we live in uh, and, and hopefully, you know, this, this pandemic, you know, silver, big silver lining would be, you know, the need to have uh, digital democracy uh, and also a healthcare system that works for people. Uh, and psilocybin mushroom accessibility is just one part of that. Yeah, and I think you know we're also entering an area, uh, an, excuse me, an era of personal responsibility and the recognition of personal responsibility in in the context of this virus going on. It's the personal responsibility to social distance, to take the appropriate measures, to stock up and make sure you're self sufficient during these periods of quarantine. I think it's pushing everyone into this realm of like self sufficiency and personal responsibility, which as we've been talking about, really ends up being the best answer to any kind of substance use as well, especially psilocybin mushrooms, is relying on personal responsibility. And so I think it goes right along with an increasing cognizance of the importance of that principle, which when you talk about the conservative election cycle, I think should be a big, uh, a, a big arena for conservatives is the idea of personal responsibility. Uh, I think it should be a big, I don't want to say revolution, but a big evolution too in our society is just the increase in personal responsibility, not the decrease, not outsourcing it to, well, the government's going to decide if I can have these substances or the government's going to mandate if I can go outside or not. Or the, you know, we, we kind of, we're at a bigger time of, of less outsourcing of responsibility and more taking ownership of our own responsibility, I guess is what I want to say. And I think um, psilocybin mushrooms falls squarely in there and you know we, this is a whole other conversation but there is that argument of you know why were these substances even made illegal in the first place is maybe it's causing you to question those authority systems that are kind of meeting out or, or that you're outsourcing your responsibility to i guess then we have this extended deadline there's this push is this the first go around for decriminalized ca and what i'm kind of thinking more long range i mean do you see this settling in for like you know, maybe a, a four year process to, you know, you had the first run, you got people activated, there's more awareness, and then kind of a couple more years of pushing on this, and maybe next time around, we're, we're in a better position to push it through. Absolutely. We, we are staunch believers in our citizens uh, open source initiative. Uh, and with decriminalization being the, the best model that we have given the constraints and restrictions and priorities that our society has and we are in it to win it uh, i have some new kind of like developing uh, career paths but uh, this is tantamount to my beliefs uh, as it is with many people and and we will continue this uh fight uh next uh you know next election cycle uh until until we've passed it and and even past that, you know, again, this is just, you know, decriminalization just opening the the opportunities and accessibility, and then it, like you've talked about, the, the community aspect of of uh, education is is needing to be ongoing as well. Yeah, and yeah, I saw that California too. So we're we're talking to folks across the the nation uh, to improve uh, accessibility to these. Uh, 
you know, these organisms, these medicines, however you want to uh, look to them, you know, we were, we got big plans uh, that just are starting. Well, and hopefully you're making, yeah, what you're doing is kind of hitting the barbed wire, as it were, kind of setting that blueprint for other people to follow to say, hey, I'm passionate about that in my state. And hopefully this kind of conversation and you breaking things, especially down to the nuts and bolts of how this works with the city, how this works with the federal, people will get a better understanding and be able to kind of grapple with the controls of their own political systems and try to put forward their own initiatives and do what you're doing. Um I think it's I think it's a really powerful movement you guys are starting. And like you said, there are other movements doing this. So it's just a really exciting time to have these conversations. And I appreciate you coming on, who's someone who is well spoken, who has a background in the sciences, who has a background in the of success in the commercial sector dealing with these things. I mean, you're a great spokesperson to play with these ideas and and really be someone who can reach across different boundaries in our society and kind of create an objective centering point to say, okay, let's get all the conversations out in the open and talk about this thing so we can really have a more informed conversation moving forward, not bringing, you know, any of our misunderstandings to the table. When I say I want to decriminalize, you know, some people, you need to make sure people are all talking the same language, I guess, to make sure whether or not they support it. And this is kind of, kind of step one. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole new language. And just on that point, uh, one of our community partners, uh, Chikruna Institute, has posted uh, not only our language, which is already on our website, decrimca.org, but the initiative language from uh, Denver, and then the decriminalized nature language uh, from Santa Cruz and uh, Oakland. So we wanted to be as transparent and open source, uh, community driven uh, as possible. So, you know, have, we implore uh, your listeners, if, if you're, you know, from one of these states that wants to turn on to, to reach out to us so that we can guide you as best as possible uh, towards success. And where are some of the best places for people to interface with Decriminalize CA? Where can people reach out for more resources, inspiration, or just to collaborate? Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, heading the social media on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. So our handle for Instagram, DecrimCA. Uh, you can search Decriminalize California for Facebook uh, and Decriminalize CA for Twitter as well. And then our website has a, a, a laundry list of uh, resources. Uh, you can read the initiative there, uh, and that's decrimca.org. Well, that's fantastic. So I do encourage people, if you're at all interested, to reach out even just read the material, read the social media. Nowadays, that can be such a great education on these topics. Read some of the conversations flying back and forth on there. That's one of the quickest ways to, to get up to speed. And obviously, if you want to start this initiative in your own area, reach out. And I found or I've heard that people are really supportive in that community to say, hey, here's all the information. It is open source. You know, Go for it and, and be able to cross promote and all that good stuff. So obviously, I'll you know, make on this podcast, I'll link up all the connections to your guys' social media, websites, all that good stuff so people can reach out. So as we wrap up here, is there anything else you personally are working on you want to mention? Um, or is there anything else that you think we may have forgotten that are that's important to this conversation? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so in this uh, time of quarantine, I've been doing a lot of deep reflection and uh, about Know, my future in mycology and the decriminalization space uh, and the cultivation space. And uh, so mentioned earlier about the, the new opportunity with mycosystemics. Uh, you brought, you yeah. brought up the intro. And this is a, a new company, a startup that's working on mushroom cultivation uh, technology uh, uh, as a kind of partner project uh, or a kind of like sister project for me. Uh, I'm talking to the uh, Decriminalized California campaign director, Ryan Manovar, about how we can uh, continue uh, with our education campaign. And so uh, we will have a release of something new and exciting around that uh, coming up uh, shortly. Uh, we've got a, a project in mind to help continue that effort to, uh, to continue uh, in training folks how to grow their own mushrooms medicinal or gourmet or otherwise um, 
and uh, and yeah, so stay tuned for that. Um, but uh, and then yeah, check out Mycosystemics. That's a cool new project. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess I'm like really excited to go out morel foraging and butter bully foraging <laughs> soon. I've been cooped up in Hollywood for a while now. Uh, very grateful to have a, a roof over my head and food. Uh, but uh, the forest calls to me. So thank you so much for having me on. Of course, of course. And I think everyone's kind of getting that itch as we're all stuck inside. It's like, I need to get outdoors. And uh, unfortunately, where I am in Marin, they shut down all the parks. So they're, and, and I mean, they've shut down trails and they have like police driving around. So I haven't, I haven't felt the urge. I've been able to get out some private property, but I haven't felt the urge to kind of break the blockade there. But yeah, hopefully things will settle out and we'll all be able to get outdoors and start start getting out there in the woods and finding mushrooms. I'm glad to hear you're a big forager. That's yeah. awesome. That's obviously where where my passion lies. So that's really cool. And hopefully we can go foraging before too long. Um, I guess my final question here, usually I have a couple final questions, but I guess what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? I know that's a huge question and people are like, uh, but <laughs> what what is the lasting impact you hope that, that your body of work kind of leads into or the lasting legacy, if you will? Thank you for that. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I, I've been very motivated by my passion uh, and I'm still kind of figuring out what exactly that means to me uh, in the mycology space. I would say, uh, you know, if, not to limit yourself. So I've, I, I've kind of fallen into a kind of like this triangle of, uh, of education, uh, uh, science slash like industry and uh, policy. And I think that's yeah. those like kind of core tenets uh, really elevate the discussion uh, for everyone. And, and there's important uh, aspects to each one of those that I, I hope everyone in, you know, my community can embody uh, and, and do that with mushrooms. Like we really need more leaders in the mushroom and mycology space and to decentralize this work uh, whether it's microremediation or mushroom medicine or decriminalization, uh, we, we, we need more voices for uh, those that don't have voices, whether they're disenfranchised communities or the, the biology, the, the mushrooms themselves need a voice. So I just hope to elevate the discussion more and more into the future. And I love how you say decentralized because I think that's so important is to not have you know one or two figureheads, but instead empower everyone to be their own voice, have their own platform, but be a connected, decentralized network that all support each other to kind of manifest our own genius out in the world. And that's something I believe really strongly. That's why I created a podcast, was more to elevate people who others may not have heard of and just be able to show all these amazing areas where people can collaborate and tie in. And there's not just one or two heroic figures in mycology. There's a lot of people doing great things that we should be aware of. Um, so I think your idea of setting up three tenets and really exploring how all of those can impact mycology and how to use mycology in those different areas and how to, that kind of forms the base of a structure. I think that's really important work. And if that, yeah. And if I can apply some of that, I, I think I'm taking away a lot of inspiration in ways that I can apply your work and really your thoughts to to my life and my own pursuit of mycology. So fantastic. I'm already doing that. <laughs> you're you're right in line. You're already making that legacy. Well, William, thank you again for your time coming on for the interview. I hope to talk to you more in the future, especially as this develops. And yeah, I just hope to stay connected with you because we're in the same zone. Go mushroom hunting. All the good stuff. Absolutely. Thank you again so much.